Hello, my name is Joanna Dillman. I am a graduate student from Queens University of Charlotte. Welcome to my COM 616 video blog. The assignment objective is to present a selected concept from our course text, Arnett, Fritz, and Bell's Communication Ethics Literacy, Dialogue and Difference. I've selected the concept of dialectics of direction and change, which is within the realm of business and professional communication ethics. Throughout this course, we have learned about the different goods different types of communication ethics protect and promote. For example, public discourse ethics protects the good of the public arena. Interpersonal communication ethics protects the good of the relationship between persons. Organizational communication ethics protects the good of the dwelling place constructed. And intercultural communication ethics protects, pr promotes and protects the good of a particular culture. In Chapter 10, we are presented business and professional communication ethics which protects and promotes the good of maintaining the existence of a company. To do so, a business must embrace a unity of direction and change in the actualizing of the communicative goods of survival and competitiveness if it hopes to last. Dialectics of Change and Direction At the beginning of the chapter, Collins and Pora's 2004 book, Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies, was introduced as a roadmap for the chapter. Collins and Pora's advi advice was simple. Have a plan and be ready to change it at the very moment that plan no longer meets the necessary objectives and goals. Arnett, Fritz, and Bell indicate business and professional communication ethics works with the assumption that direction and change together make it possible to respond creatively to ever-changing market conditions. Such an understanding of communication ethics makes public the nature of direction and change an ongoing expectation of an innovative spirit that constantly realigns direction, ever recasting the identity of a given workplace. Blockbuster is an example of a once successful company that failed to create an innovative culture and missed opportunities which caused its demise. Blockbuster was once a re weeknight tr tradition for most families. Then Netflix happened. As most of us recall, Netflix sent videos which you would have normally rented through your local Blockbuster store straight to your home without the hassle of due dates or late fees. Even after seeing the growing popularity of Netflix, Blockbuster remained unconcerned. Business Insider reported that back in 2000, Blockbuster CEO even passed up the chance to purchase Netflix for only $50 million. For the next four years, Blockbuster meandered along and, not, and didn't change a thing, while Netflix became more and more popular and eventually went from mail order service to a streaming one. When Netflix began offering an online option in 2004, Blockbuster initiated efforts to compete, but it was too late. On September 23, 2010, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. Unity of Contrary Business and professional communication ethics is a communicative action that embraces and actualizes contrary. Communication ethics in business and professional settings requires a commitment to two complementary communication actions, clarity of direction and the courage to pivot and change direction if and when necessary. The commitment to ongoing viability takes business and professional communication ethics from the realm of professional communicative forms or public manners to something beyond the manners. The how of protecting and promoting the existence of a company shapes the character of the company and its identity. In today's fast-paced environment, dynamic course correction is required to bring new business models to market. Business mo models can be designed on the drawing board, but only the application and testing in the market, often through pilot projects, provides the insight needed to understand if and how the business model will succeed. This requires flexibility to respond quickly to signals from the external environment, economic results, and partnership alignment. It involves constantly reviewing what is working and what is not, and adapting key aspects of the model accordingly, especially in fast-moving industries like the media industry. For example, Netflix continues to adapt its business model based on new technologies, such as adding streaming video to its subscription model based on changes in technology and customer preference. Beyond manners, understanding business and professional communication ethics requires one to release a basic unreflective assumption 
that a communication ethics, commitment in business, and professional environments is the equivalent of good manners and proper form. The good manners provides a means of coordinating smooth lines of interaction, such as restraint in emails and conversational tact, but the goods of survival and competitiveness provide a necessary heart for keeping a profit or non-profit company alive. Let's take, for example, 3M's formal, former president, William McKnight. He was not, in fact, a company founder. However, he was the man responsible for 3M's entrepreneurial culture and deserves the credit for what made 3M successful during its 59 years at the company and beyond. McKnight was described as soft-spoken, but also direct and efficient. His emphasis on research and development bring, brought 3M back from the brink of bankruptcy and turned into a large multinational corporation it is today. Public Accountability, Plant, and Pivot As quoted in Arnett, Fritz, and Bell, 2009, Martin Buber, 1948, stated that a human being without direction falls prey to the demonic. Business and professional communication ethics calls for public articulation of a given direction and the why for change of direction when it is called for. The aim of a profit or non-profit, uh, not-for-profit company is to keep the direction clear and responsive to change. Otherwise, those who demand the products and services and those empl employed by the firm find themselves undercut. As an example of a company who failed to plant and pivot, I will present Polaroid. The company started out as an innovative brand that brought instant photography into the playing field. However, Polaroid failed to keep up with a pulse of new technologies and failed to realize digital cameras were going to be the way of the future, and once they did, it was way too late. Film photography is now a niche field at best, and Pol Polaroid fi filed for bankruptcy in 2001. Over 20,000 employees lost their jobs, and over 6,000 retirees lost their pensions and insurance benefits. Dialectics of Change in Direction and Action Collins and Pora's 2004 book, Built to Last, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies, identified 18 companies as visionary and were analyzed for underlying common characteristics. Part of those 18 companies was Johnson & Johnson. In order to show dialectics of change in direction and action, Let's review Johnson & Johnson's history. In 1873, Robert Wood Johnson, now 28 years old, formed a medical products business with a man named George Seabury. In 1876, the United States celebrated its 100th birthday with the Centennial Exhibition, a World's Fair in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Robert attended representing Seabury & Johnson. While he was there, Robert heard a lecture given by the noted English surgeon Sir Joseph Lister. In the 1860s, operating rooms were not sterile and surgical survival rates were tragically low. Lister had taken Louis Pasteur's discovery that invisible germs cause infection and applied it for the first time to surgery. Lister's radical idea that surgery should be sterile inspired the now 31-year-old Robert Wood Johnson with a new business opportunity to manufacture the first mass-produced sterile surgical dressings and sterile sutures and save the lives of surgery patients. Robert Wood Johnson's business partner was reluctant to take a chance on the risky new innovation of making sterile surgical products. So in 1885, Robert and his young brothers James and Edward Meade left and made plans to start their own company. January of 1886 found James Wood Johnson on a train from New York to Philadelphia. When the train stopped in New Brunswick, he noticed a for rent sign on a small four-story former wallpaper factory near the railroad tracks. Getting off the train to take a closer look, he rented it for Johnson & Johnson. The little startup began with just 14 employees, founded on the revolutionary innovation of mass producing sterile surgical dressings, sterile sutures, and of promoting antiseptic surgery as a way of saving lives. The new company in 1886 offered a very different business philosophy of the day, one of openness and transparency, 
of responding to needs in society and a working partnership with the medical profession. We are all fortunate in that we are engaged in manufacturing products to be used throughout the world for the relief of pain and suffering. Robert Wood Johnson. The first products were medicinal plasters, which delivered medicine directly through the skin. Sterile surgical dressings and sterile sutures came next, followed by one consumer product, a tooth cream called Zahnweiss, meaning white teeth in German. Robert would walk through the town of New Brunswick, striking up conversations with the local business owners. On one such occasion, he entered the Opera House Pharmacy and took an immediate liking to the pharmacist, Fred B. Kilmer. Johnson and Kilmer shared an interest in Sir Joseph Lister's theories and a passion to improve health care. Eventually, Robert persuaded him to join Johnson & Johnson, where Kilmer became the scientific director from 1889 to 1934. Working closely with the Johnson brothers, Kilmer helped set Johnson & Johnson on the path it follows today. From the beginning, the Johnson brothers were astute in using information to grow the business. In 1888, Johnson & Johnson published Modern Methods of Antiseptic Wound Treatment, a how-to manual on sterile surgery with articles by the leading antiseptic surgeons of the day. As the need evolved to sterilize our mass-produced surgical products, Johnson & Johnson pioneered steam sterilization in 1891. The mass-produced sterile surgical products caused a revolution in surgery changing it from a last resort to a mainstay in the treatment of injury and disease. Johnson & Johnson brought sterile surgery to the United States and across the world. Johnson & Johnson expanded rapidly, with success leading to new products, many as a result of consumer feedback. When Fred Kilmer heard that a doctor's patient was complaining of irritated skin after removing a medicated plaster, Kilmer sent the doctor a small container of talc to soothe the patient's skin. A container of talc was then included with some plasters made to alleviate any irritation. Consumers replied that not only did the powder soothe the irritation from the plasters, it also soothed their baby's diaper rash. So, in 1894, Johnson's baby powder was put on the market giving birth to our baby products business. The tradition continued with a medical need facilitating the beginning of a successful product. In 1920, the wife of a Johnson & Johnson employee named Earl Dixon was clumsy in the kitchen, enduring minor cuts and scratches while cooking. Earl had the idea to create a ready-made bandage to aid in his wife's healing. Although they're a part of everyone's medicine cabinet today, Band-Aid brand adhesive bandages were originally such a new concept that nobody knew how to use them. From our founding in 1886 to our broad base in human healthcare today, Johnson & Johnson continues to look for ways to save and improve lives. When we began, the great needs were for mass-produced sterile surgical products, first aid, and basic public and family health. As the decades passed, Johnson & Johnson grew and decentralized, expanding into new areas of health and technologies, identifying human needs and pioneering the development of products and businesses to meet them. Today, we continue to meet human health care needs in ways that the Johnson brothers and the first 14 employees who started our journey couldn't even begin to imagine. As we continue to build on their legacy, future generations at Johnson & Johnson will continue to care for the world in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine today. The world will continue to be healed, one person at a time and the human element inherent in that makes all the difference. As you can see, Johnson & Johnson had the clarity of direction to improve health care and the courage to pivot and change direction of, of its products if and when necessary. A paper written by Edward Geeson, Eric Rid Riddleberger, Richard Christner, 
and Ragna Bell provides another resource for understanding the dialectics of change and direction concept. It utilizes the good of ensuring the company's survival, which is the good of business and professional communication ethics, by identifying when and how to innovate your business model. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation and have learned a bit more about the dialectics of change and direction. I would greatly appreciate any feedback regarding my blog.